So I, I'm a second international expert in the European Parliament and seconded uh, from the Public Economics of Germany, where I train specialists at the small university in Mannheim and Schwerin. Uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I just about language skills. Hey, Joke Glock, at Wora, Herr, in Dog. Who is Finnish? Perfect. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it showed me how difficult it is to get good language. So, the first part is refugees, potential and specific features. Then, some lessons from the past. Uh, skills recognition can definitely be an obstacle. And the main part is about solutions. The first is uh, what uh, we found in an analysis for the Employment and Social Affairs Committee. What is a kind of common consensus among international organizations? We had one of them, OECD, uh, this morning. The second part I find very relevant too, uh, to have this as a background, uh, is there are some European Union legal commitments for public employment services and the member states. Mm -hmm. And uh, the third part on solutions is about methods. And then I would reflect, uh, like to reflect a bit on the implications for public employment services service delivery, as this can be quite different depending on other factors. So factors within the public employment services and in the setting and draw some conclusions. First, refugees. Uh, we have heard a lot about features. What I would like to do is uh, just to make it more visible as uh, behind every figure or each figure there is a human being. And uh, what you can clearly see from these pictures is that we have, uh, I took the example of Syria, that we have uh, two worlds at least within one labor market. So we have all from a modern, a highly qualified elite over a medium segment, for example, in car repair, maybe with less modern technologies or small businesses on the market, uh, up to rural areas with really very traditional uh, farming. And uh, the people, maybe, but maybe they also earn enough money to pay the costs for a smuggler and to come to Europe. Who knows? So what are potential specific features, to sum it up without any further figures, any further statistics, is uh, what we find is a more pronounced heterogeneity of skills profiles, I would say, than in our own countries. Clearly a lower employment rate and a different cultural background of women. Often uh, people are working in an occupation and have a lot of experience, but they use less modern technologies. And what uh, I find also important is that we have a higher share of informal employment, including of micro enterprises uh, in different areas. And these are additional <coughs> skills. They do not belong to our normal occupational profile, but it is an own uh, skills set that can be important. Another factor, we have evidence, particularly from Afghanistan, about skills losses due to war. Meaning the longer the war lasts in Syria, the less uh, the qualifications, the formal qualifications a person has or work experience counts in case a business has been distracted. Nevertheless, as we already heard in the morning, there is always a need for individual treatment. And the more, as uh, one specific is, uh, that we often do not have adequate documents at hand. Lessons from the past, to, uh, it's a summary of research in that area. Uh, we see an insufficient labor market integration of refugees and uh, humanitarian migrants have worse results than other migrants. We see a long duration, uh, we heard a lot about it, uh, it takes six years or so to integrate 50% and we see a strong country variation. And that can also have uh, to do with the regulation of occupations, but also with the entry levels. For example, UK, Regina Kohle Seidel did this analysis, has a better results than Sweden, though Sweden is investing much more. Yes, and that can have to do with the fact that uh, the entry to jobs is uh, quite open and liberal in the UK. So we have an incomplete integration even after a longer period of time. And what is also important to know that uh, regards all uh, migrants is a skills mismatch in terms of overqualification. 
It is a decision policymakers have to make how much they would like to invest to reduce this overqualification. In a report, uh, the Danish uh, Refugee Council, uh, 15, 16 years um, ago, came to the conclusion that there is much evidence that systems for assessment and recognition often fail to offer refugees appropriate routes into employment or further education training. So something is going wrong there. And we find this also in research from 2014. Recognition of qualification is still considered a considerable barrier, particularly in the middle segment uh, of VET in the labor market. But nevertheless, we should also be aware, yeah, no, first the problems. So the problems detected, and that can serve as a kind of checklist um, in the system of assessment and recognition, is from a user's point of view, a lack of information and fragmented information. It really, can be very difficult to find uh, opaque procedures or missing procedures, so not all areas are covered. In general, uh, incomplete coverage also provisions for, uh, as regards provisions for various areas of assessment. When you go along the levels, yes, from higher education over middle, uh, vet, and so on. Uh, then rigidities. Uh, we had in the past a strong tradition of an all or nothing principle. Yes, either you fulfill all conditions or you don't get anything. And therefore many people were excluded from uh, valuable or appropriate employment. Additional procedures or requirements for non EU nationals, that is still the case. And fragmented recognition systems, uh, Austria, Germany are clear examples of that. And also a problem is uh, financial support, as assessment costs often money, it is not for free, as well as bridging systems. We heard already a little bit about it in the morning. So, there are a number of problems, but what I found interesting in a quite recent analysis uh, from the US um, is a positive statement about recent efforts. European countries and the various systems of intra-EU cooperation have been on the forefront of developing for assessing credentials for those without verifiable documentation, notably refugees. <coughs> And we have heard uh, telling innovative examples in the morning. So let us have a bit of closer look at solutions. And I would uh, start with what we can see as a kind of international consensus. Regina Kuhnler-Seidel from the Institute of Employment Research in Germany did an analysis for me for the uh, committee. And as you see, we uh, summed up uh, results from uh, various international European institutions in that period. And there is a high consensus that skills assessment should take place early and that a more flexible approach is needed. Most of it is about validation of non-formal and informal learning. Yeah, as the main problem is a lack of uh, formal qualifications or the qualifications are different uh, in the countries of origin compared to the qualifications we have in the countries uh, in place where the refugees have to be integrated. So um, a lot of alternative methods should be used. Then another point, as said, I would like to bring to your uh, attention is that there are also legal commitments. And this is a frame public employment services are working in. The first one and the earliest one dates back to 97. It's a Council of uh, Europe uh, convention uh, agreed together with the UNESCO in the field of higher education to define standards for recognition. And that is very helpful because there is uh, in the ENIC-NARIC network, a um, huge database where you can find information about procedures, uh, manuals, and also information about uh, higher education uh, study courses, but not for Syria, for example. At least I myself, I didn't find it. Uh, then a second directive is uh, very important, the so-called qualification directive, uh, together with the reception directive. The Qualification Directive uh, uh, tells us that 
uh, member states have to ensure equal treatment between beneficiaries of international protection. This means both categories recognize refugees, but also those who cannot be sent back uh, to their home countries without danger for their lives. Yeah, so both categories. And they um, should ensure equal treatment with nationals. And that is uh, very interesting. The question is whether this is enough. And there is also a provision, it is not, because the directive states that member states should uh, create appropriate schemes for those who cannot provide documentary evidence. Yeah, so, um, to put it clearly, member states, your governments, they are ob obliged to support alternative methods and procedures. But, uh, as we heard a lot of early intervention today, there is a second directive, the so-called reception directive, uh, dating from 2013. There are no such provisions for applicants. This means member states have only the obligation to create such systems uh, for the recognized beneficiaries of international protection while they can do what they like as regards all applicants. And there are other acts uh, that support or restrict assess, but I, this goes too far as I have limited time. Now it gets more practical. I think we also have a, a <coughs> set of methods that should be used. Yeah, the tasks that have to be done. And it's a summary of what we have heard today. Maybe some additional ones. So for, it starts with biographical interviews, which can be, uh, uh, which can go more or less into depth to reconstruct the education and the work biography of an individual. Uh, and the second is uh, the assessment of prior learning, this regards non-formal and informal learning. And there, there is a whole toolbox that can be used. Yeah, it reaches from simulation, for example, France does it, not particularly for migrants, but uh, to uh, simulate a working situation where it can test certain skills of uh, persons, and that can also be used for refugees, naturally. Um, completing specific work tasks, yes, that uh, can be used for academics, but also for uh, manual uh, work tasks, or in the field of arts and uh, design sample work, that you ask someone to provide something. Then a more comprehensive method would be work experience, as we also heard today, to send people to shorter or longer uh, internships uh, to an employer. There can be examination, theoretical examinations, for example. Yes, that is often being used at universities to decide whether somebody has to complete a whole study course or less, but that can also be used in the bad field. Or aptitude test, uh, tests. And uh, the next field is recognition. And uh, as you see, there can also be different levels of recognition. And I think it is important to know for public employment services, also public employment services might not be the actors who are doing this in practice. Yeah, but they at least they have to know there exists an alternative recognition, so formal recognition based upon uh, the uh, use of <coughs> alternative methods I listed. Yes, you do not have the certificate, but uh, you can come to a good picture and then people can get uh, valid alternative recognition that uh, equals the formal uh, profession qualification. Or it is conditional, for example, an obligation within one year to uh, complete a training or to get a certificate. <coughs> Uh, or it's a partial recognition that somebody cannot uh, exert the whole profession, but only uh, a part of it. We heard, uh, or I read an example about doctors, although in, in practice that might be difficult. Yeah, it has to be defined what is then a practical job for this. And then uh, there can also be uh, different uh, provisions as regards employment afterwards. Yeah, and this corresponds more or less to the recognition, whether it's conditional, whether it's partial. And what I would like to mention here is career lettering. 
yeah, the so-called bridging programs, because I think their public employment services have a function. That has to do with career guidance in public employment services, with working with uh, employers. And UK has established a program uh, for, let me just look, for which occupation? <laughs> Half a minute. Yeah, I don't have <laughs> so much time now. Maybe two minutes, yeah. Um, for example, they, uh, I do not find now the occupation, but it is um, uh, important uh, to know that a uh, person, a specialist, started, uh, starts at an assistant level, for example, but gets career guidance and it can be agreed with an employer to organize further training so that they come uh, to the full profession. What are implications for the public employment service? Service delivery. They can be very different. And I think that is the main, this I can skip. This is the main message. I think we heard that employment counselors always should do a good basic profiling and then need particular training in cultural diversity. Uh, but the public employment services role, so what your individual PES is going to do, varies across Europe. It has to do with the business <laughs> model, of, with the responsibility first of the public employment service, whether the municipality has the main responsibility or the public <coughs> employment service. It has very much to do with the service offer that is being done in-house or what the public employment service contracts out as regards in-depth profiling, testing, or career guidance. In some countries, a public employment service doesn't do anything of this. And it has to do with traditions and resources in active labor market programs. And it has to do with policy priorities, because what is the reality, the reality today in Europe? We have many public employment services where it is not, uh, who do not offer very much, or at least not yet, because the country does not have many refugees and it is not a policy priority uh, to work strongly on integration. So um, uh, the service offer can really uh, reach from a minimum, really the traditional work and refer it for all other, other tasks to other services or paid programs, to be clear, or to a comprehensive own service offer. And the recognition uh, settings also strongly differ across Europe. Yeah, Germany compensates for a gap in the assessment and recognition system by developing own tools. In other countries, the situation might be different. In Norway, that has a strongly developed uh, assessment system, including for informal learning. The public employment service might send uh, refugees simply to that system, go to this authority, and that is all. So, what are the conclusions? Public employment services in all countries have to cope with certain challenges. And the main challenge is uh, uh, maybe legal regulations. For example, uh, a public employment service cannot do early intervention as the law does not provide for support for applicants. Then this has to be changed. Another obstacle, as said, is weak or problematic institutionalization of assessment methods, recognition structures, structures, and public employment services should bring this to the attention of the government. That it is an obstacle for their work in the field of labor market integration. And uh, costs for skills assessment, who takes the costs, as refugees are normally not able to do this. A last uh, few ideas, where could European or international cooperation help beyond this uh, individual rates event? For example, to exchange training modules for employment counselors. What I'm seeing is uh, these are being created at least 10 times. Yeah? Why not uh, systematically exchanges? Or a better knowledge base on education profiles. I know that some countries <coughs> like this, but others maybe would like to get this. So, is there a way to, to share these? And a last sharing tools. For example, when in case one public employment service develops an interesting self assessment tool, online tool, or a mobile app, yeah, at least the knowledge could be shared. So, I'm always a fan of 
platform and knowledge sharing. And let me end with one statement. I myself, I'm deeply convinced that working with refugees and improving the public employment services and the institutional assessment work for refugees will have positive uh, a positive impact on working with migrants in general, but also with unemployed, as we need a better assessment everywhere. This is all I have to say. Greetings from the Parliament, and thank you for attention. And to find some publications uh, we have prepared for the Employment and Social Affairs Committee on the desk. Thank you. Thank you.